I was told by medical personnel that everybody at 40 is a candidate for another set of eyes. Now you can imagine someone of 80 plus. Um, the leader of the opposition, on whose behalf I make this presentation, will and has distributed a um, huge booklet which I've been advised will be launched at the end of this presentation that sets out our priorities. I have done a summary which I now want to present to you. This summary will not go into the details um, sector or program by program, but it will capture the significant issues in the economy and what we need to do as a country. Budgeting is the best period to judge the progress the country is making. This progress must not be measured only against impressive figures of economic growth, but on how these figures have positively impacted people's lives. For example, Minister of Finance has told us that the economy grew by 5.2% last financial year, as compared to 4.6% of the previous financial year. And the target in the medium term is 7%. You need to note that while the country has maintained decent figures of economic growth, unemployment and poverty levels have remained high. The Uganda National Household Survey of 2019-2020 put poverty levels in the country at 20.3%. And a multidimensional report released by Uganda Bureau of Statistics, which studies deprivation, put dimensional poverty in the country at 42.1%. Unemployment, according to Minister of Finance, has increased from 88.8 to 8.8 in 2019 to 12% in 2021. That's why Uganda is ranked country 159 out of 193 countries by the United Nations Human Development Index report, the latest one. Because human development is measured mainly against progress in education and health. Public debt is our number one challenge as a country. The public debt has reached 97.4 trillion, which is 52% of the country's GDP. It had hit 53.7% at some point in 2022-2023, according to the Auditor General. The International Monetary Fund argues poor countries not to contract debt above 50% of their GDP. It is unsustainable. Because GDP simply means the value of goods and services you are producing. So if you are unable to get money from the goods and services you are producing to pay your debt, it means you are in a crisis. And that could be the reason the Minister of Finance, if you read their documents, are trying to revise the debt figures. They put them at 86.7, which is 46.9 of GDP to make it look sustainable. Finance claims public debt declined from 48.4 to 46.9 last financial year. Next financial year, ladies and gentlemen, you need to take note and I, that government has allocated 20.6 trillion, of which interest payment is 7.6 trillion and 13 is payment of principal. 
20 trillion in a budget. Initially it was 52, now they are fidgeting with it. 54, 58, but 20 trillion of that budget is debt servicing and 7.6 is interest payment. That means that uh, debt servicing will consume 38.4 of our total budget. This financial year, last financial year, we spent 16.5 trillion on servicing the debt, which has now grown by 5.517 trillion. Minister of Finance has, after deducting all obligations, presented to Parliament 21.7 trillion as the available discretionary resources for the next financial year. This is the money that Parliament can reprioritize. You need to take note that uh, what they are presenting actually is it's not as much as they, they presented because they are not reducing 7.5 in wages and salaries, 316 billion in gratuity, and 263 in the pension. When all this is reduced, the resources for Parliament to prioritize next financial year will be 13.6 trillion. That is the budget that the government has presented. But you will see the minister with a huge bag, and he will say, I have brought a, a budget of 54 trillion, when actually the budget is 13. When you remove the wages, you remove the debt servicing, you remove gratuity, you remove pension, all that you remain with is 13 trillion. That's what debt servicing has done to our economy. In a space of one year, it has grown by an additional 5.5, as I said earlier. In fact, the NRM should have chosen budgeting for debt servicing as their theme. The Auditor General notes on page 43 of his report that 25% of taxes collected are spent on interest payment, and 10% of our taxes goes towards in, uh, payment of the principal. I am now on external debt. While in principle, we are not opposed to borrowing to finance the country's development agenda. We reject mortgaging the country through reckless borrowing. Reckless borrowing is eroding our sovereignty as a nation. It is also imposing a huge burden on our children and grandchildren because some of the debts will mature when we are either dead or are no longer in service. Uganda's external debt stock according to Auditor General, is 52 trillion. Our annual external debt servicing has reached 3.2 trillion, of which 19 trillion is interest, the money that we are paying to our foreign lenders. 1.9 every year is interest. About 12 trillion, which is 23% of this, is from China. That money, unfortunately, including money from China, includes commitment fees on undisbursed, you can use the ordinary English, on unutilized loans. We will therefore be paying 8.8 billion per day next financial year in foreign debt servicing. We will be paying 8.8 billion per day next financial year in foreign debt servicing. So I want to break these figures. So every day, we will be paying 8.8 .8 billion every day in the servicing money that we have borrowed from many lenders, including China. Of the, and, and that is just interest. Of this, 5.5 5 .5 billion will be interest. No, 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 so the 8.8 .8 is the total sum we will be paying every day to our foreign lenders, 5.3 billion every day will be interest payment, 5.3 billion every day. You can count 24 hours, 
8.8 will now have gone to foreign lenders in debt servicing. And I want to look at Chinese loans. Country is collecting 1.1 billion from Uganda daily in debt payment, of which 358 million is interest daily. So you can count 24 hours, and China has taken 1.1 billion from Uganda, of which 358 is interest every day. Annually, China is collecting about 412 billion in debt service, of which 130, 130 billion is interest. I started with the debt, this is annual. As of December 2022, China, through her Exim Bank, had extended loans worth over 3.4 billion, approximately 12 trillion to Uganda in the last 10 years. China accounts for 75% of our bilateral debt stock and 23% of our total foreign debt. China, according to the report on public debt, holds the largest share of undisbursed debt stock at 29%. The country is paying 434 billion in commitment fees for unutilized loans. We are paying 400. 43 billion in commitment fees for unutilized loans. A bulk of this money, 124 billion, which is 29%, is paid to China, as earlier noted. And you know Chinese loans are expensive. We contract them at 2%, compared, say, to IMF and World Bank. Uh, I have been unable to provide the the list here of Chinese loans that we have contracted, but we can, uh, we can, can provide to you for science and technology, roads and so on and so forth, the power dams. So this list we will distribute after. And I want to go to domestic debt. According to the Auditor General, domestic debt has reached 44.6 trillion. This is mainly the money government borrows through sale of bonds and treasury bills. Next financial year, we are required to service interest on this domestic debt to the tune of 5.6 trillion. There are bonds and bills that will mature, and because we don't have money to clear them, we will run to the nearest bank to borrow 9.5 trillion to service this domestic debt. This is what economists at the Ministry of Finance call domestic refinancing, debt rollover. This 9.5 trillion debt rollover and 5.6 trillion interest brings the total domestic debt servicing to 15.1. So we require 15.1 to service domestic debt. And please take note of the following. Even what government calls Domestic debt. Actually, it's not domestic debt. Why? Our financial sector in Uganda is dominated by foreign players. We have 25 licensed commercial banks, only four are local banks. So even the government tells you that we have gone to borrow locally, they go to Stambik, which is not owned by Uganda. That's why all the interest will go away. But they will have told you, no, 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 this is foreign borrowing, this is domestic. Actually, it's not domestic. The list of the banks is also provided. We can share 25 licensed banks, only four are local. And then we keep borrowing from these banks and tell the country that this is domestic borrowing. Actually, it is also foreign. You need also to take a note the points that the Guild of Opposition area made. Because if you borrow from foreign lenders, and I've given the figures every year, and even what you call domestic borrowing, you go to the same lenders, but they, are, they only have branches here. They take 20 trillion every year is paid to service debt to banks that are foreign owned here and banks from foreign countries. And then you go sector by sector. You look at the telecom sector. The key players are foreign. All the money they get is repatriated. You go to the energy sector. Even after disbanding the Uganda Electricity UEB, 
we went and uh, brought in foreign companies to run our energy sector. So Meme is taking money, Stambik is taking money, then you go to borrow from China, and then you don't have to be an expert to know why poverty levels are rising and why the levels of unemployment are rising. And most important to note is that we borrow money and don't utilize it. And then we pay exorbitant fees. So the total of undisbanded loans now is at 18.7 trillion. So this money we have uh, filled the forms, they have given it to us, it is available. But we are not utilizing it, so the requirement is that we will keep paying fees. And we keep paying the fees, but the money is not utilized. The Water General Court is a lower figure of undisbursed loans at 14.5. As I said earlier, we are paying 400 34 billion annually in commitment fees on money we are not using. The reason we delay to utilize loans is because of undesigned projects. So they urge. Procurement is done at a, a nail speed, and the right of way is not obtained before we go to banks to borrow money. We have segmented. Because the point we make of the resilient communities, look, in agriculture we borrowed money. 309 billion borrowed to boost agriculture is unutilized. And uh, we provide the table here for you to see. We borrowed money for digital transformation. It is also not utilized. We borrowed money to fix our broken road network to the tune of 13.2 trillion. It is still there, not utilized. There are road projects such as upgrading the well of Talangu, for which we borrowed 44 billion from OPEC in 2018. You can imagine we borrowed 2018 to upgrade this road, but the money is there. We acquired 895 loan from the African Development Bank for the construction of Kampala Jinja Expressway. That money is also there. Government is looking for money to pay for, for, for passage. So the money for roads, even before you begin the allocating what is available, even if you are using just the money that you have borrowed, 13.2 trillion and the roads that are affected a list is here, it will be provided the same applies to the health sector where we have borrowed money to fix our health infrastructure but this money is also not utilized it goes to innovation, technology and development transfer in the manufacturing sector, 276. In public sector, 43 billion. Regional development, 109. I am giving you figures of money borrowed for these sectors or for programs that is not utilized. In the energy sector, we have borrowed up to 3.3 trillion. We have used only 2.3 trillion. And a list per sector is provided, which we will be sharing. I have now moved to domestic areas. The total stock of central government area, according to finance, rose from 4.8 trillion 2020-2021 to 7.9 trillion in 
So the finance presents a figure of 7.9 trillion as our domestic area. The Auditor General presents a figure of 10.8 trillion. And this is money owed people who have supplied the government in various categories, including court awards, taxes, pension, ETC, rent. What is worrying is that uh, government is only providing 200 towards clearing domestic area. So government uh, owes its suppliers 10 trillion, but in the budget they are providing 200 billion. So it will, it will take them maybe my remaining entire life, because I am 50, I don't think I will reach 100 for this government to clear this debt when they are not contracting a new one. I now move to abuse, as noted earlier by the leader of the opposition, abuse of borrowed money. You may all have interacted with the report of the Auditor General. The Auditor General reports on page 84 that we we have vaccines for COVID worth 300 billion that have expired. Remember the loan the last parliament contracted during the COVID period from World Bank and IMF. 300 billion was used to buy vaccines. Now these vaccines have expired worth 300 billion. There are other drugs at national medical stores worth 33 billion that are also expiring. Interesting. The Minister of Health now says they are going to use money, part of the money of Gavi, to go and destroy the, these vaccines. So you have borrowed the money, vaccines have expired. Now the money brought here by donors to deal with other problems is what you are going to use to, to go and destroy the expired day vaccines. I am reading all this list that will bring me to a figure because we need to clean the budget. Our proposal is that this budget must be clean. One of the figures that you will find in the budget, aggregated figure, this government is spending 187 billion on renting offices every year. 187. Even if you are not a contractor and they give you 187 billion every year, you can construct offices for someone. But maybe these buildings are theirs. 187 billion is what is being provided in the budget for rent. And we have provided a figure. Can you imagine you go to France and you rent for embassy 3.9 a year? In five years, anyone, even of average understanding, will use the 3.9 per year to construct. But we are spending, and the whole list is provided here, what we are spending on embassies, what we are spending on buildings, including later on I will be showing you, we are also renting uh, some structures for state house. Maybe the president and his wife are not fitting in uh, Nakasero and Entebbe. So they are renting extra buildings. So the list is provided here of where we are paying money for rent. Next financial year, we will spend 780 billion on transporting public officers. 780 billion. On average, that's what we spend. Because Usually we spend 220 billion acquiring new vehicles. We spend 404 billion fueling them. 155 billion on maintaining these vehicles. So in a year, we are spending 780 billion. The leader of opposition earlier spoke about phasing out, uh, which is part of the presentation that you have reducing on cost of public expenditure like RDCs. Because an RDC in Rubaga, the best you can do is buy him a motorcycle. 
someone is resident in Rubaga, that's where he's an RDC, you buy him a pickup of 400 and then you fuel it and maintain it and give him a drive. And all they do is to visit one radio station after another to go and uh, badmouth the opposition. And you will see a whole fleet, 200 vehicles, brand new pickups for RDCs. And you all know what they do in your respective areas. Because they, you can even buy them bicycles. So the table here is showing how much you are going to spend on buying vehicles, on fueling them, and maintaining them. We are also spend, we are going to spend 162 billion on donations by our leaders. And the list is provided here. Mr. Seven, under his residence, he will donate 77 billion. Again, he has what he calls support presidential initi initiatives, 59 billion. Parliamentary Commission has 4.9 billion for communication and public affairs. Again, Seven has 4.2 billion in his office for donation. The Prime Minister has 3.7 donation. The Speaker of Parliament, 2.4 billion donation. The National Council of Sports, 2.4 billion donation. The government whip has 1.8 billion donation, not his entire budget but he has 1.8 billion for donation. The opposition whip has zero. If the leader of opposition has nothing to donate, what about the leader of opposition? So the whole list of who has money to donate that comes to 162 billion is here. You can interact with it. We are going through this list, and I'm about to come to an end. I say this is going to be a summary. Looking for money that will be reprioritized. That's why we are going through this list. Money for donation, money for vehicles, money for this. All this money can be reprioritized in the sectors that the head of opposition outlined here, health, education, sectors that are going to help our people. But before I do that, let's look at the revenue projection. We had problems with the finance when they came to Parliament. They said revenue the projection was that it was, was going to grow by less than 1%. Yet on average, it has been growing by, uh, by 11%. And that's why they had maintained 29 trillion when you go to the side of um, resources to finance next year's budget. When we, man we maintain the annual revenue growth of 11 it means we will have 33.4 trillion and not 29. And then I want to come to other areas to complete the list of what we have identified as luxuries in the budget. That list, if it can be highlighted there. Next financial year, we have 34 billion for ceremonies and state functions. 34 billion. When you see these NRM people going to a function, they have 34 billion for ceremonies and state functions. Travel in Iran, next financial year we have 671 billion. Travel in Iran. And travel abroad, we have 108 billion. We have 152 billion for workshops, meetings, and seminars. 200 and 
97 billion special meals and drinks. We have, I have already read out the list of donations. We have 133 billion for welfare and entertainment. When you put this together, you will have 1.5 trillion that is available. And our proposal is that even if you reduce it by just 25%, you'll have 1.1 trillion available. I now come to our budget proposal. After we think the realistic budget for Uganda should be 43 trillion shilling, not any other figure. Why? If you look at the, and you need to take note of this, every year government presents a budget, and I'll use last financial year, they presented a budget of 54 trillion. When it came to the actual release, they usually publish in newspapers that we have released the money. Most of the time they have released the air. Because what that release means is that they have now asked the government agencies to begin submitting invoices to finance for payment. When those invoices are submitted to finance for payment, there is no money. The most interesting thing is that uh, even when they budgeted for 54 trillion, they made the release less than 5.4 trillion. By their own release, they have a budget of 54. When they published the theoretical release, it was raised by 5.4. When it came to actual money that is spent, it was actually 43 trillion. So the, the realistic money that was available, that was spent, was 43 trillion. But they released uh, about uh, 49 trillion in theory. But they did not even release the whole budget as, as they had presented it. Uh, we are doing this coming to a figure, and this will be the, the last part. The figure that has, a, if you can go there, the figure that has our budget. So we, we've made proposals on what to remove, what to reallocate these sectors. And I said we will not be going into details of what we intend to, to reallocate and to what particular sector and department. But eventually when all this is done, um, you will come to a budget of 43 trillion shillings when you have removed all the luxury. And our proposal is that uh, once you've dealt with this luxury, next year you don't even have to go and borrow nine trillion uh, from commercial banks. And then if for a sustained period of three to four years you are not borrowing, it means now you'll have more resources available. You'll no longer be spending 20 trillion on servicing debt. Finally, um, I hope I have been clear because I said this is going to be a summary. The NUP president, the Honorable Chagulani, made here very substantive statement on seven being our problem, and I share it 100%. Part of the problem that we have in this budget <clears throat> and this indiscipline is replicated elsewhere, is that the country has been made to finance Museveni's life, both public and private. I'll give you an example. The title first lady means someone who's wife, isn't it? In fact, it's not even provided for in the government hierarchy. But, Next financial year, we are going to pay someone. His name is Waiswa Charles Baker. 
His job is executive assistant, first lady. So, for Museveni's wife to be Museveni's wife, we must recruit staff for her, including an executive. I don't know really how he's going to engage with two adults who are married. But his job, and he's paid four million. Because how can you be paid to be an executive secretary to an existing office? The office of first aid does not exist. But we are recruiting someone to facilitate that office that does not exist on the government's structure. And the name is there. You can look at the policy statement of the presidents. We also have a, a special presidential assistant on household affairs, Butajira Enro. This person is paid the this person is paid the eight million per month to help these two adults on their household affairs. And that brings the entire list of people who work at Museveni's residence to one thousand. As you, you earlier interacted with it, he has a 51 cleaners, 62 cooks, he has 80 gardeners, 29 housekeepers, 10 dobby and around area tenants, 100 private secretaries, 14 room attendants, 22 presidential assistants at the residence, <clears throat> 51 waitress and waiters, and 14 presidential advisors. So these are people who are supposed to be helping our president and, and his wife because State House is provided for under the Presidential Monuments and Benefits Act as a residence of the president. <clears throat> Interestingly, and we'll be sharing these lists as well. Mr. Museveni has also created another category of mobilizers and political, some of them are mobilizers, political assistants in the state house. They do Museveni's political work, but they are paid by Uganda. For example, someone mentioned Namiaro here, the one who was in Kororo abusing Muslims who went to Foftari. Her salary in the state house is 12 million per month. But she sits at Museveni's office as chairman of NRM in Chambogo. So someone who is employed by NRM in Chambogo is on the payroll as a special presidential assistant, 12 million per month. That list has nearly 200 people who are doing that sort of work, will be sharing it. So honorable members, the details of our locations, of our proposals, are uh, in a booklet that the lead of opposition will launch. And these proposals are proposals sector by sector, program by program. What I have outlined here is a summary and the structure of the economy. So I want to thank you very much for listening to me, for God and my country.